Storyteller's Thread, a monthly podcast devoted to young adult literature and the art of storytelling. I'm your host, Sean Connors. On each episode, we invite an author for young adults to take us inside their work, and in doing so, to talk about their writing process, their inspiration for writing for young readers, and the general ins and outs of earning a living as a professional storyteller. So, whether you're a compulsive reader, an aspiring writer, a teacher or librarian, or simply a frustrated reader who's counting the hours until you get home and dive back into that novel that's waiting for you on your nightstand, this is the place for you. Hey, it's January 1st, 2020. Thanks for being here. And Happy New Year. And Happy New Decade, too, while I'm at it. I hope you had a festive holiday and found time to relax and do some things that you enjoy. As for myself, I spent quite a bit of time outdoors, going for long hikes with my faithful sidekick, Arthur Smalls, the Black Lab, and I even managed to put a dent in the stack of books that's been sitting on my desk for the past few months. Of course, I've also been busy podcasting, and I'm excited about the lineup of guests I'll be talking with in the year ahead. Speaking of guests, this month I'm talking with writer and filmmaker Christine Day whose new middle grade novel, I Can Make This Promise, has quietly been generating a lot of buzz. A member of the Upper Skagit tribe, Day grew up in Seattle, Washington. She holds a master's degree from the University of Washington, where she created a thesis on Coast Salish weaving traditions. Her first novel, I Can Make This Promise, was published in fall 2019 and was inspired by Day's own family history. The novel tells the story of Edie, a young girl who, in searching to uncover her family secrets, also finds her own Native American identity. Because her mother was adopted by a white couple shortly after she was born, Edie assumes that the questions she finds herself asking about her Native American heritage are unanswerable. But when she discovers a box hidden in the attic, a box that contains letters signed Love Edith and photos of a woman who looks just like her, Edie sets out to uncover the truth about her mother's family's past. School Library Journal has described I Can Make This Promise as a beautifully written story, and the Children's Book Review called it a moving novel that highlights the importance of family, friendship, and maintaining a connection to one's culture. A review in Publishers Weekly was no less complimentary, noting that I Can Make This Promise considers historical truths about how Native Americans have been treated throughout U.S. history, particularly underlining family separations. Today's novel has been named a Charlotte Huck Award for Outstanding Fiction for Children 2020 Honor Book, and it was featured on NPR's Favorite Books of 2019. When we talked, Day had just returned, like literally, from a week-long writer's retreat where she'd been working on her second novel, which will be available in 2021 from Heart Drum, an exciting new native-focused imprint with Harper Collins. As you'll soon hear, we covered a range of topics in our time together ranging from Day's experience as a Native student who struggled to see any trace of her culture represented in her high school's curriculum, to the transformative role her experience in the University of Washington's graduate program in Indigenous research and documentary film production played in helping her to cultivate her voice as a storyteller, to the ongoing need for books for young readers that depict Native American characters in a broad range of contexts, including contemporary urban settings. I found Christine to be an absolutely delightful person. It was like talking with an old friend, and I learned a great deal from talking with her. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Prior to publishing your first novel, you wrote an essay for an edited collection, Our Stories, Our Voices, in which you reflected on your experiences as a student in high school and then later in college. I'd like to talk about that essay if we could, because I think it provides a helpful framework for thinking about the issues you write about. Sure. You attended a suburban high school in the Seattle area, and in your essay, you recall the school's mascot, a Thunderbird, having appeared on the school's official crest. And you go on to note that in traditional stories, the Thunderbird's often depicted as a powerful figure. But in your recollection, you describe the icon on your school's crest as, I'm going to quote you, a frozen caricature, a stencil-led silhouette deprived of movement and color. Mm. So reading your essay, my sense was, the way you set that image up, my sense was that you intend it to serve as a metaphor for your experiences in high school as a Native American student. 
Can you talk about how or why that's the case? Yeah, totally. I think that's a really good reading of that particular image because that really is what I was trying to convey with that. You know, it's one of those things where it's really interesting when, for me, I grew up sort of in diaspora, as mentioned also in that essay, and as I'm sure readers can tell from my other work. And it's really interesting doing the work of reconnecting and of spending more time actually in Native communities and how Native people talk about themselves and tell their own stories versus the types of stories and how Natives are talked about, say, in an American textbook. It's very different. With textbooks, we're really relegated to the past. In the public's imagination, it's scarce to find anything really about Native people, about the diversity of Native nations, or about just anything really having to do with like what really gives those communities life, what those relationships are like in any sort of substantial way. And so for me, I did want to try and convey in a sense how it really felt like that sort of rendered, how we were really rendered invisible and how we were really um, just sort of seen as like, you know, there was no color or no um, vibrancy that is a little bit misleading, I think, especially, as I said, you know, with what's going on in a lot of Native communities now and also just in how there are certain practices and certain things that never really did fade into the past. Those stories and those relationships still do exist despite everything that's happened. You mentioned the word diaspora. And as you said, you use it in that essay, and you recall in your essay having been introduced to that word as a student at the University of Washington, Bothell. Mm. And you remember that moment as having marked the first time in your schooling career Mm -hmm. that you felt reflected in the curriculum. Yeah. Which, as a teacher, is both incredibly powerful, but also quite saddening to me. Can you talk about how or why that was the case? Yeah, totally. It was very, like you said, powerful and sad, because I think it is one of those things where, um, you know, something I've found myself sort of repeating a lot lately in a lot of the conversations I've been having uh, with fellow writers and with people who are involved with this work, teachers and, you know, librarians. One of the things that I really, part of the reason why I'm drawn to writing for children is because I want to help kids understand or sort of build the vocabulary to tell the stories of their own lives because I do feel like that vocabulary was definitely missing for me personally for a very long time. And I think that I didn't realize that, that just putting language to things is like, I'm such a language oriented person. (laughs) And, you know, to have words like diaspora, which, you know, it's kind of, it is a contradiction because I really am in this region that I know now has all this history that is just really deeply embedded with my own ancestors, what they did and what, again, Native communities kind of continue to do, but to feel so disconnected from it and to kind of have to have it sort of written off as, you know, the Pacific Northwest was discovered by Lewis and Clark, for example, or the Denny Party founded Seattle. And, you know, that's such a slim recollection of what actually happened. This wasn't just an unoccupied wilderness out here. And yeah, I uh, I don't know, diaspora, it's really, it's an interesting word. I think that's one of those words that people feel across a lot of different communities, a lot of different experiences. I want to stay with your experience at University of Washington Bothell. You describe yourself as having immersed yourself in the humanities. Mm -hmm. And you took a number of writing and literature courses. Mm. Were you a reader and writer prior to college? 
I was. I totally was. It's interesting because I've definitely fell in love with books and reading, especially as a middle grade reader. (laughs) And, you know, I think that's when a lot of kids, a lot of really avid lifelong readers sort of discover their love of books. And that's when a lot of kids become independent readers for the first time. And, you know, still to this day, there's certain books from that time period where it's like, I can recall really specific images or like turns of phrase. So one example, I remember reading Ella Enchanted when I was in, I don't know, fourth or fifth grade in the library. And I remember being so struck by the fact that she wore the green dress to her mother's funeral. That's what she wanted to do as opposed to wearing the black. And it was just like, I mean, it totally (laughs) just stayed with me because it was like, wow, what a like brave but meaningful thing to do. And I think that that's just moments like that. I love so many middle grade books because they're all so full of moments like that. So I was, I guess, immersed in the humanities kind of my whole life, but I didn't, it was like a a whole new, I don't know, a whole new experience of really seeing myself as a student of the world again, (laughs) because I think that I kind of, I had that when I was in like a middle grade reader and Maybe sometimes with like certain books as a YA reader as well, or even in certain moments in high school. But I think that for a little while there in my adolescence, I was just sort of having a, you know, probably some just mental health stuff that I kind of just tried to bury and didn't really address. And, you know, personal losses in my life, things like that, that sort of drew me out of that sense of being immersed in the humanities of trying to find that sense of wonder in the world. And it wasn't until really I was a little bit older and had pulled myself out of some of those things that I was able to find it again in community college and University of Washington Bothell. Growing up, did you have access to books that featured Native characters? No. You know, well, actually... There were a couple. So um, I had the first Strawberries by Joseph Bruchak. And I do remember reading that picture book a lot with my mom. Um, I know that Cynthia Lytic Smith was publishing around that time, but I don't remember her books ever being actually in my libraries in school. And I'm not sure why that was. Maybe, Maybe they were and they just weren't exposed to me. Actually, the first... Well, then there was like sort of maybe a little bit more problematic or uh, complicated, romanticized versions of natives, right? In books like Walk Two Moons, I did, I grew up, I loved Walk Two Moons. I like read it over and over. And her name is supposedly comes from a tribe, but it's a tribe that doesn't exist or something. Uh, so it was something, I don't even remember exactly what it was, but I know... That was one of those examples of like a more romanticized narrative about natives. And it was also just, it didn't show, again, that sort of diversity or sort of reality. It's just this sort of a loose, um, sort of mythologizing real people almost. And so um, there was Walk Two Moons. And then there was also a similar thing with Twilight which I loved when I was 15. (laughs) I loved it so much. And I still do have a really like a soft spot for that book because that was one of those books where I I had really not been reading for kind of a long time. I don't really remember reading much when I was in seventh, eighth or ninth grades, really. I'm sure I was assigned books, but it was like the books that were assigned to me, I just didn't find as interesting. And I was really skimming them. And I thought that I just wasn't much of a reader anymore. But I think it was actually just that, you know, they're kind of the drier books that are seen as like classics that kind of the teachers just kind of have to teach them and the kids just have to read them. And there wasn't a real love for it. And then Twilight came out and it was this book that I 
I got it for Christmas when I was like 15 and I read it over the course of like a single day. And I read it over and over. <laughs> I, That's a love I, story there. <laughs> it was. And it was so like, I mean, I think it was especially interesting for me because, you know, I remember reading Bella's, um, her take on the Pacific Northwest and how green it was. And I remember walking outside and just being like, wow, she's right. It's really green here. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that I never really thought too much about. And then, you know, she was like this kind of a quieter girl. I felt like a quieter girl. She had done ballet lessons as a kid. I did ballet lessons and she was also so brave. I think that people really underplay just how brave she was in that first book, how she just is, you know, goes and tries to save her mom. And then, of course, with Jacob, it was like, that is a real tribe. And he was just this regular high school aged guy who had a sister who went to Washington State University. And I was just like, wow, these are like, really contemporary native characters like who would have thought and again there are you know some kind of some iffy things with that because it's the same sort of thing where there's a lot of mythologizing sort of around native people creating this whole other werewolf mythology that might make it seem like they're not actually a real tribe but they are and that they have their own things that they have going on with like language revitalization and things that are important to that real life community, you know? And it's like, if you go there, they have these like signs up, they have like things where they kind of have to play along to this pop culture phenomenon that kind of unexpectedly put their little reservation on the push on the map, you know? And then there's just all kinds of other things. But I also, on the other hand, I don't know, I find it so fascinating because one of my like personal readings of Twilight is that it's not a romance, it's a tragedy. Hmm. And also that the vampires are kind of a metaphor for colonizers because the native people are the ones who remember how dangerous they are and they want nothing to do with them. And, you know, what does colonization do? It converts people and it kills people. And that's like what vampires do. And so I find it very fascinating. <laughs> but... Oh, no, that is. That, that, is really, that is really fascinating. Have you written about that? You know, I've talked about it a lot with okay. all different people. This is like one of those conversations I find myself having over and over yeah. because I'm just like, you know, I mean, the... The, like, patriarch of the Colon family, his name is Carlisle. Oh, wow. Like, the Carlisle Industrial School. Mm -hmm. When Jacob is sort of, you know, indoctrinated into the the werewolves, what happens? His long hair is cut. Right. You know, that's him finding out the truth about the vampires. And, of course, there's, like, this long history of, at the residential schools, Native kids were forced to have their hair cut, especially boys. And so, you know, I think that there's, I think there's a lot there. And I think it is something that people shouldn't so readily dismiss, you know? Oh, I, no, I think that, I think that's fascinating. <laughs> you know, and the reason I asked you about having access to books that featured Native American characters when you were younger, I taught on the Navajo Reservation mm. in Arizona. I later worked with um, Native students at a high school in Flagstaff, Arizona, for several years. And this is in the early 2000s. And try as I might, it was impossible virtually to find books that featured those characters right. that, as you said, didn't portray them in problematic ways. Exactly. I was just wondering, as, as I was listening to you, if part of your falling away from reading in high school had to do with the fact that it doesn't sound like you did have opportunities to see yourself represented in the curriculum. Sure. And I think that probably was a big part of it. You know, I had all these books in my curriculum that felt so far removed from my life as well. You know, things that were like, you know, using language that felt very unfamiliar, almost foreign to me. And, you know, it's so important for for young people 
to have themselves represented and to also just have books that are fun, you know, to have books that are like really exciting to read that like have colloquialisms that they recognize and settings that feel relevant and subject matter that feels relevant, you know, things like, you know, The Sun is Also a Star by Nicola Yoon. Like, what a great book for young adult readers, for example, to have today that really deals with issues around, like, immigration and sort of stereotypes and sort of little micro histories that just come together in a really fascinating way. That's just one book that just popped in my head is like a really great example because it's so interesting. There's so much sort of meat to it. You can build so many interesting lesson plans around it, but also it is a fun love story. And I just love that it's like this really, um, you know, there's so much to enjoy and there's so much to learn and discuss. I want to come back to your essay for a minute. You talk about graduating from UW Bothell Mm -hmm. and then going to earn a master's degree in the Indigenous Research and Documentary Film Production Mm -hmm. program at the University of Washington, which I think is really fascinating that you had that experience. And I'm curious, what drew you to that particular program? And how did your experiences in it impact or or shape you as a storyteller? Oh, yeah, that's that's a great question. So, you know, I was debating between a few different grad programs. I always knew that I wanted to write books. So obviously an MFA in creative writing was sort of one path I could go down. Or I was also, you know, I was like, should I be maybe a little bit more practical and get like, you know, library science, that would be really fun (laughs) sort of thing, you know, or just, I came across this program, though, and I don't even know, you know, I don't really consider myself to be a filmmaker. (laughs) (laughs) Because <laughs> it's like, I mean, I, I suppose I did. I made, I made one like a short, rough one for the program for my thesis, and it was a process I really did enjoy. But I wasn't like about to go out and get all of my own equipment and like continue trying to do this on my own. At least not at this point in my life, because it's like picking up a whole new creative trade, right. you know, and it's really a lot of work and just takes so much technical knowledge that is just a little bit above me (laughs) and so um you know it was one of those things where I had a lot of fun there and really the main reason why I was drawn to it was because I was just like these are native people telling stories Mm. and regardless of the medium that's where I want to be (laughs) and so that's kind of you know, I called them and I filled out my application and stuff and I sent it in and I crossed my fingers and, you know, it was a really wonderful experience. My mentors there were and are so knowledgeable and they're just like such a source of kind of richness and newfound connection in my life. And by doing that program, you know, I've was able to find all of these really great texts. Most of them are more sort of academic and nonfiction type texts about Native scholarship and uh, decolonizing methodologies and things like that. You know, Native representations in film took a lot of classes on that. And just the conversations that we would have and being able to sit with, you know, the academia that contemporary Native people are doing right now and that they really care about and are invested in right now and how that kind of just like led to so many other questions and sort of lines of inquiry that I was then able to explore, especially in I Can Make This Promise and in just other things I'm also working on, you know, having that like foundation of just, again, it was like unlocking more language, like widening my own personal vocabulary for how I was going to approach really telling my own story and then moving outward from there. Yeah, I don't know. It was really fascinating. And I was able to do these like great field trips that really inspired some particular things from I Can Make This Promise, especially where I was able to like 
go and visit the historic site of Old Man House. Obviously, that made a big impression on me. Learning more about the Suquamish people and just spending time really talking about all these sort of counter narratives to those foundation myths around here and having it be on such a hyper local perspective was really rich. And I think that having experiences like that where it is so specific that actually helps your ability to tell a really universal story because the truth is the more specific you are and the closer you are to just following your own sort of gut instincts and the things that really just matter and are so close to you, that's when you really make a connection with other readers as well. Obviously, we're talking because... You are a writer. Yeah. And I, I want to dig into your writing. One thing I want, I want to say, based on what I've been able to learn about you as I've been doing research, I think it's fair to say that you have developed a healthy sense of appreciation for the persistence that a writer has to show to land a book contract. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would say so. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk about what your experience trying to get published was like? Yeah. Totally. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, I can make this promise was the fourth manuscript I actually wrote from start to finish. It was the first one I truly loved. The first three, I queried them all. You know, I researched that whole process of what it sort of takes to get published traditionally, because, you know, obviously with self-publishing, that's a whole nother thing. And I've, I've known people who have really done well for themselves doing that. But in order to do that, you have to be such an entrepreneur and you have to be so marketing savvy and really, you know, build a following and, um, I don't know, solicit editors, like freelance editing, all that stuff, design the books, design the cover. Like you have to do all of that on your own. And I had absolutely no interest in doing that. Like none. I, like we said, I am a writer. That is what I do. Right, <laughs> you right. know, I don't, I am not like great with all the other stuff. But um, so the first three, I initially, when I first started trying to get published, I thought for sure that I just wanted to write YA, actually. The first, the very, very first one was this horrible supposedly dystopian YA that wasn't even really dystopian. I'm not entirely sure what it was. It was strange. <laughs> that's, that's what it was. It was just a really odd book. And I remember, you know, I sent it far and wide and I was just so excited because I had finally finished something and I heard back from absolutely no one except for one agent who wrote back to me and said, I really like your sample pages, but I feel like your voice is more contemporary than dystopian. By any chance, are you working on anything else you could show me right now? And I was just like, oh, contemporary. But I was still on this like speculative kick. <laughs> I don't know. So I wrote this. It was a contemporary story, but it was sort of a contemporary retelling of Wuthering Heights. Again, that's how I pitched it. That's what I thought I was kind of achieving, but it was once again, very odd. And like, <laughs> I, I don't know, I was taking a lot of Gothic lit classes at the time. And I thought I understood what I was doing, but I really did not. And, you know, I sent it back to her and I sent it out far and wide again. And got a little bit more traction and more people were like, oh, this is an interesting concept and your sample pages are interesting, but then it all kind of fell apart after that. And I just fell out of love with both of those, just as I did with the next one where it was a um, another ghost story. It had something to do with like a paranormal reality television crew that goes to this girl's house and I don't know, it, whatever. I don't, all of those are, are just shelved because they were great learning curves 
And certainly there's a lot to be said about just finishing something and about writing 50,000 plus words. But, you know, I think that really my problem was that I wasn't actually trusting myself as a storyteller yet. Hmm. I was really just doing the speculative stuff. I mean, I, I really, there's so many speculative authors that I love, like Patrick Ness. I have followed his work very closely for many, many years. Uh, Tahara Mafi, I love her work. In terms of retellings, I love like the Lunar Chronicles by Marissa Meyer. You know, I was kind of trying to channel these things that I had seen other people do really well and that I really enjoyed reading. But ultimately, I was always kind of hanging back a little bit. Mm. I um, I was just trying too hard to be so original and interesting. And I was just following trends, you know, that I saw happening in the publishing world and thinking that I could, like, ride some wave. But really, I hadn't dug too deep with any of those. I hadn't really let myself feel vulnerable hmm. through the process of storytelling. And I wasn't sort of doing that thing you're supposed to do where you write for just an audience of one, right? Uh, who who was it that said that? I think it was Kurt Vonnegut said that, you know, he was always writing to an audience of, of one. And I believe for him, it was his sister. And that that's how, again, going from the very specific you are then really able to connect with people. And so with those first three manuscripts that I wrote and fell out of love with and tried something else, something weird and speculative and just totally random, really. Like I didn't have a real vision for how I would sustain a career that way. You know, like I didn't, wasn't seriously asking myself, do I want to like write books like this? You know, can I see myself doing this sort of thing Again and again, I wasn't really. I think that with books like I Can Make This Promise, I can see myself just writing similar middle grade stories over and over. You know, I, I love it. I love the sort of quieter coming of age stories. And I love getting really specific with the like histories and the geography and all of that stuff. And so it's like, you know, that's really who I am. <laughs> that's like what I find very interesting. And so like, that's really where I should have started. But alas, you know, again, all a learning curve. So I did those three manuscripts. And then I saw this flyer online. It was Penguin Random House. They had put out this call for submissions from unpublished, diverse writers who were going to write something, some contemporary middle grade fiction in honor of Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry. And I saw that and I was just struck by it. I was like, middle grade. And again, I realized that that was where I really fell in love with books. And I started having these like recollections of, you know, the Ellen Enchanted wearing the green dress and Coraline, which was the first book that actually gave me nightmares and things like Holes, that song and Holes and the whole backstory with Kissing Kate Barlow and all of these books from that time in my life when I was really becoming such an avid reader just sort of came back to me and I was like, well, why don't I do something like that? <laughs> and so after I saw that call for submissions, I sat and I was like, okay, well, if I were to write a contemporary middle grade book and it's diverse and it's from my perspective, which by the way was something I had not done yet. None of my characters were like really specific Coast Salish native characters, which is another thing I find very interesting. They were all just like, I don't even remember. They, I mean, they were so vague to me, those characters. So I sat with this. And at that time, I had just recently found out that I was going to be doing 
the film program at UW. And I had already been sort of brainstorming, well, what would be some interesting things for me to research while I'm there? What would be some interesting things to film? And I was kind of considering, you know, potentially looking into my own personal history. And that was something I had actually discussed with one of my mentors when we first met. And he was like, oh, yeah, you're coming doing this program. And you know, your backstory would be a really interesting thing to, you know, a starting point just in that first sort of conversation we had. And I was thinking about that. And I was just like, you know, what if I were to do something inspired by my family's history, but to fictionalize it so that I don't feel quite so vulnerable, but to also just, you know, I had this image of a young girl going up and finding this box in the attic. And then from there, I just, I wrote this whole outline for this book. And then I basically closed myself off in my room and I didn't emerge for like four weeks. <laughs> and then I wrote the whole first draft. I mean, it was rough and it needed a lot of work. But after I wrote that very first draft of what would become, I can make this promise. I just had this resounding sense of, this is it. You know, this is going to be my first book. Well, let's let's talk about I Can Make This Promise. For listeners who haven't read it yet, would you mind giving them a sense of what the book's about? Sure. So I Can Make This Promise is about a young girl named Edie who is 12 years old. And like I said, she basically finds a box in the attic with her friends filled with these letters and photographs from a woman who looks a lot like her and who also shares her same first name. But she doesn't know who this person is or who they might be to her because her Native American mother was adopted when she was a baby. And so she thought that was just the end of the story, that she was adopted and didn't know anything about her birth family or native community or culture or anything until she finds this box and basically starts to investigate it for herself. As important as Edie's story is, mm-hmm. and I can make this promise, her mother and her grandmother's stories are equally important. Right? Mm-hmm. Did you know from the outset that you wanted to write an intergenerational story? Or did that evolve over time? You know, I... I did know that I wanted it to be an intergenerational story. Okay. But it's interesting because there are certain things that are included in their stories in the final version that, like, they became a lot more important and a lot more, um, you know, a lot fuller as characters in later drafts. For example, in the very first draft, the other Edith didn't go to California at all. So things like that were added in sort of later. But the intergenerational component was always there. Why was that important to you? Because with policies like the Indian Child Welfare Act, the intention was never to impact a single child or a single family. It was always about impacting generations of them, about fundamentally changing the future of Native nations. And so to me, that intergenerational component was always, always very important. Can you talk about the Indian Child Welfare Act? I mean, that's at the center of the book. Yeah. And it was passed by Congress in 1978. But for listeners who aren't familiar with it, can you talk about the history that predated Mm -hmm. and necessitated passage of it? Yes. So basically... What happened before it was passed, between the 1940s to the 1970s, is estimated that about one out of three Native babies and children were sort of forcibly separated from their families and communities and often adopted into white households in an effort to assimilate them and to disrupt those relationships that really make Native nations strong. And this was all sort of 
an assimilation project, much like the residential schools were that sort of predated them. And it was eventually stopped by Congress because I guess they eventually realized that this is kind of a messed up thing to do. <laughs> so, But unbelievably, not until 1978. Like, yes. That's the thing. As I said, working with Native students in Arizona, I had met grandparents yes. who had been affected by the practices you're describing. But I had no idea that it was perpetuated into the 1970s. And yes. reading that in your book was astounding to me. Right. I think a lot of people don't realize how recent it was. And you want to hear another interesting little tidbit. Mm -hmm. My mom had never heard of it. Really? She had no idea that this was such a widespread thing until I came along and started researching this stuff. Uh (laughs) And I was able to tell her, you know, when I was in college and like I said, doing a lot of my own research and I was just I came across this information and I was just like, mom, did you know that you were like one in three, that this was not just you, but so many native kids. And she had no idea, but I guess that's also another part of it, right? Is to make people feel very isolated Mm. and to make them think that they are sort of on their own, which is just another aspect of its insidiousness. You've intimated that I can make this promise is informed by your own family's history. Mm -hmm. And as I was was reading the book, I was thinking, I would have to imagine that writing a story that's so profoundly personal would be difficult. Mm. What kinds of challenges, if any, maybe you didn't, but what kinds of challenges did writing such a personal story pose for you and, and how did you address them? Sure. So I would say... That very first draft of it was just pure catharsis. But then going through the revisions process and really like after that first sort of buzzing high of like, wow, this is going to be it. This is the story I actually really love. Then from there going and just being like, wow, this is actually going to be very vulnerable. (laughs) And like (laughs) other people are going to read this. And, you know, I think for one thing, one of the challenges was the fact that as we've discussed, Native kid lit and YA fiction is so very limited. There's really not very many stories out there that show Native characters in a contemporary context or an urban context or really delve into these histories and family histories that for so many people, the trauma can still be so fresh. And maybe you experienced this with some of the Native families you worked with who maybe, you know, you know it happened, but they don't really talk about it sort of thing. Yeah. I think that those silences are another thing that to then bring it all out know it's going to be printed in a book can be a little bit intimidating and um knowing that like the stakes are just a little bit higher for someone writing books that fill a gap this big and that's how a lot of people have sort of come to me and been like you're really filling a gap here you know there's a serious need for stories like this but it's also just you know, for me, I was terrified of getting something wrong. (laughs) I was like, wow, even though like, I know that, you know, sort of being mainly in grad school as I was writing it, and then like, knowing I am a pretty good researcher, (laughs) like, I was just like, you know, there's this real fear that even with all the research and all the personal histories and sort of things that I know to be real like what if I somehow just got it wrong I don't even know like it's kind of an maybe an irrational fear but it's a very like real ah, it's it's kind of scary (laughs) what was the fear of when you say to get it wrong like I get the sense you're not just talking about getting facts wrong yeah I don't know just 
overlooking something important about it. But then again, at the same time, you know, I know this is my first book and I hope to write many, many books and you can't squeeze every single little thing into every single book because again, you have to be very specific and you kind of have to be mindful about the things that you are including and when it makes sense to include things when it doesn't, et cetera. But yeah, I don't know. I think it was really just, you know, I, I think it's probably just a normal sort of irrational writerly fear that there's something I missed, that there's something I missed pretty big somehow, <laughs> you know, and I don't know exactly what that is. I, I can't really put into words what exactly I was afraid of. I just know that I was having some really weird dreams leading up to the release date <laughs> and that like, <laughs> and you know, it's just one of those things where again, just knowing that it's kind of a vulnerable place and that there's just, I don't know. It's just a really, um, it's a sensitive subject and you want to be really mindful with sensitive subjects and, just do the best job you can. And I hope I did that. I want to pick up on the point that you made about filling a gap. Yeah. As I was preparing for a conversation, I came across information by the Cooperative Children's Book Center mm -hmm. at the University of Wisconsin-Madison mm -hmm. that suggested that of the 3,134 children's books published in 2018, 50% featured white characters. Mm -hmm. And that percentage was actually down from 2015 when 73% of the children's books published featured white characters. Mm -hmm. And although representations of other racial and ethnic groups made slight gains in that three-year period, books featuring Native characters continue to account for approximately 1% of the whole. Wow. So this might not be a fair question because, you know, recognizing this problem is so vast and, and complex, mm -hmm. but I'm curious... From your perspective, what can be done, do you think, to increase mm. representations of indigenous protagonists in books for young people? I mean, that's obviously a tremendous oversight. It is. You're absolutely right that it is. And, you know, obviously I am just one person and I'm not on that sort of side of publishing, but I know that my editor, Rosemary Brosnan, and Cynthia Lytek Smith, who is an incredible author and also just an incredible human being, they both are, you know, they're launching a native focused imprint called Heart Drum mm. in 2021 with HarperCollins. Wow, that's exciting. Yeah, it's very exciting. My second book is gonna be one of their one of the first in their lineup. So oh yay. Wow. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. I'm I'm very excited about it. And I'm really excited with their vision for it because they are really going to focus on contemporary stories and diverse stories. And so that's one, like their sort of vision for this imprint is something I would recommend other publishers and other just people in publishing, wherever they are in that realm, you know, if they're one of the ones sort of doing acquisitions or marketing whatever their role is if they want to be part of the solution turn to folks like rosemary and cynthia who are really you know using their positions of influence to address these gaps i'm very excited to see what other books come out with that imprint because i think it's just going to be incredible and they also have a um a middle grade powwow anthology, which I will be contributing to as well. So I'm in like two of their sort of opening roster positions. Um, I'm really excited about it. <laughs> that is really exciting. Yes. I'm glad you're going to have that opportunity. Yeah, me too. Have you had the opportunity to talk with students who claim indigenous identities about your book? I have. How have you found they tended to receive it? You know, it's been really one of the best parts about this whole publishing journey <laughs> because you know again with the fear and the reality that you know you can do the best job you can but then it goes out into the world and it doesn't really belong to me anymore that whole story that i had in my head and that lived on my laptop kids are reading it 
and Native kids are reading it, non-Native kids are reading it. I went and did an event at the Suquamish Elementary School, actually, and uh, Edie is Duwamish and Suquamish. And so there's also a scene uh, in the first chapter of the book where she is on the Tulalip Reservation. And this little girl came running up to me after my presentation to proudly tell me that she is Suquamish and Tulalip. And, you know, I think it was it was just this really cool moment where she was just so excited and she had me sign her folder, you know, and it was very sweet. <laughs> and so that was really awesome. It was it was just incredible to know that this young person, she was maybe in fourth or fifth grade, felt really recognized by me and by the fact that it was so close to her, you know. So that's one example. I also, I met a Suquamish teacher when I went to NCTE in Baltimore this past November. And this and this young woman runs up to me and she's just like, so I heard that you wrote a book with a Suquamish character. And I was just like, that's, that's me, you know? And she was just like, I'm Suquamish. And I am just, you know, like she was just like over the moon, you know, and was so excited to read it. And it was like, what are the chances these two Coast Salish women in Baltimore, like all the way across the country, you know, and she actually teaches in in Oregon so it was like just just this incredible sort of full circle moment as well and also there's this blog called Children of the Glades it is a group of native kids and teens who read and review books especially books with native content and this 13 year old girl named Ashley wrote a really beautiful review of I Can Make This Promise. And, you know, they tagged me on Twitter and wanted to show me that <laughs> this 13-year-old girl felt similarly really uh, represented and that there was just like certain things about the book that she picked up on that I haven't even seen, you know, professional trade reviewers pick up on. So that was really cool. And... um yeah, that's definitely been one of the best parts. And it's also been really rewarding to like connect with non-native kids who have really loved the book as well. And they love Edie because they too are artists or they have gone on the ferries in the Pacific Northwest. Like she goes on a ferry with her family and you know, they are all very curious about the dog, too. <laughs> they, they ask a lot of questions about the dog that's on the cover and appears in the book. And so, you know, it's it's been really awesome. <laughs> I'm listening and I'm, I'm thinking kind of brings our conversation full circle in that the response that you've described to the book on the part of the kids really speaks to the issue we talked about earlier, the, the power of, of representation. Yes. And seeing yourself represented in the media that you consume. Exactly. Exactly. The critical reception that I can make this promise has received has been really incredibly positive. I'm curious, what, if anything, has that meant for you as a writer? Has it changed anything for you? You know, I'm still grappling with this a little bit because it is incredibly rewarding. And I'm really proud of the, um, you're right, the critical reception, again, you do the best you can, and you hope that your book will find its readers and that people will enjoy it, but you don't go in expecting anything, or at least I didn't. <laughs> like, I was totally prepared to just let the book fly under the radar and, <laughs> you know, just just float out into the world and maybe connect with, like, two people, but it's been really bewildering. It's totally been an honor to have people choose it for their best of lists. It even was a Charlotte Huck honor mm -hmm. book, yeah, which was <laughs> which was just amazing. And you know, it's been really just an honor. I 
I'm really grateful for everyone who has read it and loved it or connected with it in some way. At the same time, I like, you know, try to keep in mind that at the end of the day, it is all very subjective, you know, and that I am not writing for critics. I'm writing for that now that little audience in one that I keep in my head for I can make this promise. It was my younger self. (laughs) And with my second book that I'm currently writing, it's my younger self at like two distinct points in my young life. And so I try to just keep it in my periphery a little bit. You know, I celebrate and I'm so grateful and it feels really good to celebrate after all that fear. <laughs> but, <laughs> but at the same time, it's one of those things that I can't place too much value in because that would just, if I put too much value into it, I will never be able to write anything again. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's one of the, yeah, it's one of those things where, um, it's wonderful if people get it, if they come along for the ride and they're like on this journey with me and we're all just sort of having this connection and this like almost like a group meditation (laughs) (laughs) sort of thing, you know, like that's beautiful. But yeah, I'm trying not to give it too much weight. And I also have like been really struggling with writing my second book anyways, just worrying about um, making my editor happy and making her continue to like me, (laughs) and like, which I know that she does. And she's like reassured me on this many times because, you know, I totally, I have like my dream team between her and my agent and it's something I didn't totally prepare myself for mentally, I think. That like, you know, you reach this point, you sell the book, you all celebrate, you all love this book kind of equally, right? Like we all love it so much and it's beautiful and wonderful. But then it's like, oh, I now like this was hopefully just the first of many. And now you have to like start from scratch and somehow recapture that same magic that you all signed on for the first time and you know rosemary at one point she told me she was like you know christine if you you just came to me with perfect books i wouldn't have a job (laughs) like (laughs) she has to edit it you know and like help me find that um help bring it to its sort of full potential and so i'm still I've been grappling with that all year because I found writing book two to be extremely um, excruciating for a very long time. And I just had too much in my head about worrying about whether or not it would be liked by these people I have a lot of respect for and who are very close to me and who have really, who are the first people to see this publishable potential in Mm. me. You know, it's a really close bond that you form with your agent and your editor. So long story short, if I add like critics or anyone else into the mix, I would just lose my mind. (laughs) You'd be paralyzed. I would be paralyzed. Exactly. (laughs) So, so is the expectation for your second book, is that, is the expectation that'll come out in 2020? 2021. 2021. Uh, It's winter 2021 release. Yes. It was originally going to be a fall 2020 release but then rosemary told me about the heart drum imprint and basically gave me the option she was like well we could have you be fall 2020 season with harper children's or you could be a part of our inaugural heart drum titles and it was a pretty obvious choice for me and honestly having a few extra months to work through all this just the jumble in my head (laughs) was really nice. So, (laughs) Well, that's exciting. I can't wait to see it. Uh, Thank you. And thank you so much for taking time to talk with me. I I really appreciate it. And I just have so much admiration for your book. 
Thank you. And as I said, I'm excited to see what you continue to do. Thank you so much. That really means a lot to me, Sean. That's our show for this month. Thank you for being here. If you're looking for something to keep you occupied in the winter months ahead, you can find Christine's new novel, I Can Make This Promise, in bookstores now. I look forward to seeing you back here next month when we'll continue to talk about the craft of storytelling. Till then, happy reading. Mm-hmm.